So uh, for those of you who know me, you'll know that I'm a phylogenetic fanatic, okay? The bigger the tree, the better. And it's actually nice to follow a sponge talk because the first phylogenetic tree I ever made was a sponge. So it's great. So uh, basically, um, some of you might know that um, uh, you can't do any ecology without uh, phylogeny these days. Or at least if you send a paper to, to me to review, that's what I'm going to tell you. And I'm sorry. And uh, Tom Bridge can attest to that, wherever he is, um, that... Uh, I, I, I do that to him. So <laughs> basically, the reason why you can't is because um, if you're looking at uh, traits across a number of species um, and you want to do some sort of regression or correlation analysis, those data are not independent, okay, because they are taken from a phylogenetic structure, all right? So that's why, um, really, I, I love to um, collaborate with ecologists and show them that uh, phylogeny is really important. And for me especially, a phylogeny represents a way to... Um, have an, an evolutionary perspective on an ecological story. And so first of all, I want to talk about how phylogenetics is done in the center. And so I've basically done a couple of graphs where I've looked at the output from the, uh, from the Center of Excellence for Quarry Studies and uh, basically how many papers have the word phylo in there, in the title abstract or the keywords. And as you can see, um, the center is great, we're brilliant, you know, we've producing a lot of papers, and, you know, phylogenetics is there. Um, on average, okay, there's been 106 papers that have phylogenetics or some form of phylogeny or something in there from 2010 to 2016. And uh, basically, um, those studies, um, only about 42 of them have actually had, uh, have deposited new data into NCBI, into GenBank, okay? And the majority of those studies have uh, listed that data set as being of phylogenetic value, okay? So, um, so there's 22 of those studies. It's kind of mostly phylogenetics, and um, it's mostly for fish and corals, which is great. Um, so this is a good start, but uh, hopefully we can uh, build on it. So why do I like phylogenetics? Well, so I'm part of um, Program 2. Uh, it's Ecosystem Dynamics, Past, Present, and Future. And like I said, phylogeny gives us an ecological perspective, and we can do a lot of things like that. And basically, phylogeny is uh, kind of a ubiquitous tool to look at lineage relationships, systematics across a number of groups. Uh, but it's also uh, very useful to look at the evolution of functional traits. And uh, what I like to do is look at rates of diversification. And for the last number of years, I've also been very interested in trying to explain this pattern the, um, what we know is the marine biodiversity hotspot, uh, I call the indo austrian archipelago, some people call it the, Carl Tri the Coral Triangle, there's also been another other, number of other groups, but what I've been doing is using uh, phylogenies to look at ancestral biogeography, trying to understand the processes driving biodiversity gradients, um, I'm particularly become interested in how we view endemism, and also provinciality, how we break up the tropics and identify different uh, regions across that space. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of work I've done and some of the stuff that I'm going to be doing uh, as part of my, my DECWA project. So first of all, um, an example of how we um, look at functional traits. Here is um, a phylogeny for uh, Labradae, a um, group I like the most, and this is from a recent um, paper I was involved in, uh, in biological reviews. And basically what we're looking at here is mapping on the um, different diet modes that you find in wrasses, okay? And on the, uh, on the other side, on the... On my left, um, we have um, a, a trophic timeline, okay? So instead of looking at the, the lineages, we're actually looking at how many times each of those um, different, tra uh, different diet categories occur. And so every line is uh, for a different diet, a different uh, trophic mode, and every little triangle represents an origin of that trophic mode uh, in, in a new lineage in, in Labrids. And if you look at herbivory, it's a bit different. We're actually, there's a couple of different colored uh, black triangles there that represent the, um, basically the different um, forms of herbivory, mostly um, in the, um, the pirate clade. So what I wanted to take home from here is that we can look at this sort of thing uh, in a phylogenetic context, and um, we can also say things like, um, in, in, for Labrids, for instance, um, at least for the past, past 7.5 million years, there's been no new trophic mode added to the system, at least in these broad categories. So we might say that for Labrids, um, the reef system and the critical roles that uh, are played by some of these lineages, um, the reef system has trophically been in place for the last 7.5 million years. Something I've also done is looking at lineage diversification, and these are uh, four different uh, phylogenies here. Um, Sorry, the names aren't on them, but you have um, the Labradae, um, Chilodontidae, 
uh, apigonids and um, palmocentrids. And basically, those triangles and little dots are different ways of identifying shifts in diversification rate and also lineages that are significantly more diverse than you would expect given the age of the family and the, um, the standing diversity. And what it shows is that there's a lot of these clades that are the more reef associated a clade is, the higher diversification rate it has. And what's interesting is that these clades, when you simulate higher rates of extinction across these trees, they remain uh, significantly more diverse. So there seems to be this, um, some sort of link between higher diversification rates in these reef, more reef associated clades, but there also seems to be some kind of capacity for um, reef association to um, act as a, a, in, in having less extinction. And we actually showed this in a, in a paper in 2014 that I was a part of. And when you look at um, uh, patterns of quaternary reef refugia across the Indo-Pacific, you can actually see that it, it's a better predictor of areas of higher biodiversity. So the more um, coral refugia you have, the higher um, reef fish biodiversity you have. And uh, there is kind of a, a double effect here where you had stable coral reefs were actually housing older lineages of fishes, sort of acting like a museum, but also the fragmented nature of this um, stable habitat and uh, the, the distance between these uh, stable um, patches actually um, promoted subsequent diversification within these groups. So moving on to um, some ancestral biogeography. So um, the thing about this pattern that we all uh, like to look at, um, uh, the... Uh, marine biodiversity hotspot. Um, it's not a classic hotspot that um, you might uh, think of in terrestrial sense. It has, so it has what well, has both uh, latitudinal and longitudinal gradients. It also has uh, this pattern where you have a central core um, biodiversity um, hotspot, which I call the indo australian Archipelago, and some other people do as well. Um, and this is the center of um, highest biodiversity. But then on the periphery of this hotspot, you also have endemic hotspots, and these hotspots would be things that would be closer to the, the classic terrestrial sense where you have um, areas that have the highest numbers of species that are only found there, they're, they're endemics, and um, they might be under some form of threat as well. But uh, these areas, basically, the, 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 it's caused a lot of debate in where Indo-Pacific biodiversity for, for fishes and corals has come from because the center for biodiversity doesn't necessarily equal the center for uh, endemism. And there's also on top of that, you have this uh, assemblage structure across the Indo-Pacific where you can identify regions that um, have a particular assemblage makeup. And uh, this is one study done by Kubicki and others in 2013 where they used uh, an estimate of assemblage dissimilarity to um, basically uh, delineate the geographic space across the tropics. So some of the questions that we might want to ask is, okay, well, how have these, how have these gradients and these different types of hotspots formed, and what's the, um, uh, how uh, do we look at provinciality? So starting off with latitudinal diversity gradients, um, I'm just going to show you some work that was done by um, a master's student from Brazil, Ale, and he's actually just uh, arrived at JCU. He's in the crowd as well. And uh, this was his master's work, but he's hoping to continue stuff similar in the future. So looking at... Um, rates of speciation extinction and dispersal from tropical areas to uh, extratropical areas. So from these um, from tropical band to more temperate regions. And so looking across these different um, uh, reef fish families. Uh, in red, you can see the speciation rates, uh, or you can see the rates estimated for tropical lineages. And in blue, it's the extratropical lineages. And then the purple is actually um, models that have come out where, um, it's, um, where the model has uh, assessed the best model assess includes a kind of a, um, a between region speciation. So that means that it's more kind of like vicariance between those two regions. And so basically most of the, uh, this, this, this kind of screams out that there seems to be, um, for most clays, there seems to be higher rates of speciation in the tropics, lower rates of it, lower or equal rates of extinction um, with the extropics, but then um, there seems to be more uh, dispersal uh, from tropical areas to extropical areas. And so this basically, from a number of models, this actually points, there's most evidence for this out of the tropics model, which is similar to what we see in mammals and birds as well. Um, uh, that uh, you have, well actually, not, I can't remember if it's birds, but definitely mammals, where you have uh, higher speciation in, in the tropics and lower extinction and uh, more dispersal from tropical areas to extropical areas. So the latitudinal diversity gradient has been studied a lot in terrestrial systems, and uh, so this was a nice little study that kind of uh, starts, starts it off in, um, 
uh, marine systems for fishes and for, for coral reef taxa. Um, but when we, when, it looks at, when we look at the latitudinal diversity gradient, um, it seems that, at least for uh, some uh, preliminary work I've been doing, that we don't really have any strong um, um, signal of there being higher speciation rates within the IAA when you compare it to outside the IAA. So here we have uh, a number of other uh, families. And um, in, the, um, in the light yellowy-orange, you have uh, inside the IAA and then blue is outside. And what I think is kind of uh, interesting here, when you look at speciation, um, you have uh, more of an effect of um, kind of vicariance between the IAA hotspot and areas outside. So if you think of the um, vicariance between um, the Indian Ocean and um, the Indo-Australian archipelago and the far side as well. So there seems to be more of a kind of a, um, an effect of vicariance across uh, barriers. So at least it seems that the hot spot is not so hot. But uh, moving forward, I think in this sort of stuff, uh, it's, it's time that we start looking at how we can look at both axis of these gradients and try and compare latitudinal and longitudinal gradients in a meaningful way and using um, uh, phylogenetic methods to do that. So moving on to endemism. So a lot of the um, debate in the literature about the origins of uh, Indo-Pacific biodiversity has um, been around this idea that the, some areas are a center for origin, uh, or at least the, the center for biodiversity, it's either a center of origin, uh, um, a center of uh, overlap, uh, a center of accumulation, and, uh, or a center of kind of survival. And uh, this is basically the data that's been used to look at these things in the past is the age and location of endemic species. And these centers of kind of hypothesis that you might read about, I don't think they're, they're really that helpful anymore. And I would like to move to um, basically trying to estimate um, areas that are like, basically estimate areas that have been important as a source and sink areas. It's, it's not really a new idea, but I think it's at the heart of it. Uh, if everything's a center, then nothing's a center, and that's the way it's going at the moment. Like that, these peripheral biodiversity, or these peripheral endemic hotspots, seem to have um, uh, both um, endemism and uh, like. There seems to be levels of endemism, but also these uh, wide-ranging species as well. So I won't talk too much about that, but. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is we still haven't really pinned down this idea of, the, of age and location of endemism, especially in reef fish. So there's these ideas that you can have an old endemic, um, which is a paleoendemic, or a new endemic, or a, a neoendemic. And so basically, neo, it's a new species. You might consider it at the, it's close to its location of origin where it first became a species. And so this might be an indication of some sort of source or cradle for biodiversity. And uh, so paleoendemism means it's an old species that may actually represent a species that might have been widespread and it's now uh, at its last place of survival. So you might think of that area as like a sink or a graveyard. And then, um, so this is work in, um, that I recently got published in Biological Reviews. And I kind of put forward this term about eco-endemic, which might be a third option where I'm not really sure what it might be, but it could be an old species, it could be a new species, but it could just be something that's happy being an endemic. It's been an endemic for a long time or a short time, but there's some sort of, might be restricted by life history traits, or it might be very, um, uh, it might actually be uh, quite happy being an endemic and might actually become very abundant in its endemic range. And this leads to some stuff that uh, Tom talked to yesterday about um, this lack of double jeopardy that Terry has shown in some of his work, where you, some species of fish have uh, endemic fish have uh, as high abundances as um, congeners that have very wide ranging, um, uh, very wide geographic ranges. So I'm going to kind of gloss over what is a marine endemic because there's lots of ways you can slice an endemic, but uh, and I'm going to ignore uh, eco-endemism and try and just get to this idea about do we know where we have old endemics or young endemics. And so to do this, um, I had a, a look at a list of um, reef fishes and basically ranked them from uh, their smallest range to their largest range and just took the top 10% and called those endemics. We can, we can argue about that later if you think that's a good way of doing it or a bad way of doing it. Um, but so 600 endemic reef fish species and from looking through literature and my own access to different phylogenetic trees, I could find 103 estimates for these uh, for these endemic species, so it's about 17% of the sample. So it's obviously very incomplete sampling here. And to assess whether we've got old end endemism or young endemism, I kind of took an arbitrary, semi-arbitrary um, 
uh, age of 2.6 million years, okay? And that's basically the Pleistocene, so there's a lot of um, glaciation in the Pleistocene, and uh, that has impacted a lot of, oh God, really? <laughs> okay, so basically you can see here that the, the pattern of, um, uh, basically the pattern through time is that we have endemism everywhere. We've got paleoendemism, endemism, neoendemism. And if you look at the map, there's also, um, while you have peripheral, endemis, per, peripheral endemic hotspots seem to have higher proportions of endemism, um, there seems to be very little pattern um, other than that there seems to be a mix of processes going on. Moving on, if we, take, if we look at phylogenetic provinciality, uh, on the top you have this based on just assemblage dissimilarity, but when you put in a phylogenetic dissimilarity, you can see that there's this rearrangement of what the clustering of different assemblages might look like. And uh, this may, it makes sense to me that you see this expansion of this Indo-Pacific sort of cluster, and especially over to Madagascar, because you've got a lot more um, reef refugia there in the past that's actually have, so we've got shorter phylogenetic links there. There's a couple other things going on in that, but I just want to see that these are the types of things you can do with phylogenetic trees. Okay, what do we know? Where should we go? So basically this is a study I did back in 2014, and I looked at basically how much um, phylogenetic information do we have for reef fishes. So we've got the 10 sort of reef fish families that we have there. And uh, basically, um, towards the tips, you can see that we have a very undersampling. So anything that's kind of gray means that we're missing a lot of species there. And the maps then represent uh, ecoregions that have different levels of phylogenetic sampling. And so you can see that anything that ha that's a circle in black has less than 10%. So these might be areas that we can look at in the future and some of the families that we might be concentrating on in the future. Another thing we can do is just say, hey, let's just take everything we can find in a gem bank, throw it into a big tree. And I like that. Okay, this is, okay. So uh, basically getting away, getting away from this um, kind of, okay, work from the top down and see, okay, this is what we have at the moment. Um, so basically all of this is a collaboration with Yale and UCLA. And basically the idea was to get as much data as we could stick it in a genetic analysis and see what came out. And so we were able to um, basically get a tree that was a sample for 37% of all fish species, okay? And this includes pretty much all orders, nearly all families, and, uh, but it's still the data matrix, it's based on 27 markers, but it's only 13% complete, okay? So this is good, this kind of follows the stuff that's been going on for birds, for mammals, for reptiles, that we now have a big phylogenetic framework where we can look across the entire thing. And so everything that's in blue and uh, red there are actually, um, there were missing species that we can then put onto these phylogenetic trees. Okay. Uh, also, if you look at a reef-associated fish level, this tree represents, at least the molecular data, there's only 44% sampling of all the fishes that we might find on coral reefs. So moving forward for my DECRA research, I'm going to be uh, taking a phylogenomic approach, and this is using ultra-conserved elements, and these are basically a target enrichment ca uh, capture approach. It's been used very well in, um, in fishes to look at um, the... Um, to look at the, the deeper structure in the tree. And uh, so this is just a, a quick graphic of, of what it actually does. Uh, but I'm going to be applying it to labrids, and because I'm a glutton for punishment, I'm also going to look at a cropper day as well. So basically, these two trees here represent um, anything in red are lineages that are currently missing that don't have any molecular data. So um, in labrids, you've got 48% species missing molecular data, and in a cropper day, you've got 40% missing molecular data. And so these are um, uh, these collaborations. This is done in collaboration. The fish will be done in collaboration with UCLA and Yale, and uh, then the, um, the, the coral side of things is done in with uh, Harvey Moog College, and also interacting with the, the Museum of Tropical Queensland as well. Um, and basically the idea is try and get full sampling for these trees. Instead of taking this top-down approach, uh, we're working from the bottom up to really sample the things that are going to be, uh, that we're, we're going to need to know about moving forward and, how, and um, basically looking at kind of traits that we want to, we really need a fully sample phylogeny. Okay, just want to say thank you to uh, the ARC uh, Center of Extra Coral Reef Studies for hiring me and um, the ARC for uh, providing me with a Decker grant. Thank you very much.